Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 204, I chat with Mark Waldrop about high-end and high-resolution audio. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E. F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded May 1st, 2014. Episode 204, High on High-Res Audio. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Mark Waldrop, a recording engineer and the founder of AIX Records uh, and itracks.com. And he's coming back on the show for, uh, uh, I guess, the third or fourth time. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Hey, Scott. Good afternoon. It's nice to know I'm not the only one that has tech problems once in a while. <laughs> yeah, those of you who are listening to the show after the fact, uh, we we had a few tech problems, but we got rid of them. We 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 solved them thanks to Padre SJ very much for uh, his help on that. Uh, those of you who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv, can post questions for Mark as we go along, and I will pass along as many as I can. Now, Mark, you've just returned from the Axpona high-end audio show in Chicago. Give us a little, uh, little report on what was new and exciting and interesting at the show. Yes, I did. I've, I've actually been involved in that show since its inception about five years ago. My friend Steve Davis started it down in Jacksonville, and and so this uh, was the second time in Chicago. We had a nice big room and, and partnered with some uh, high-end equipment vendors, including Bryston and German Physics and uh, DH Labs, Cables, Dolby Digital, and otherwise. Um, it's rather difficult, except for the last afternoon, for me to escape the room since I'm somewhat proprietary about being able to, to present my uh, selections and, and, and talk about how high-end music affects me and what it means for, for people going forward. But it... Uh, it was a good show. I did manage on Sunday afternoon to get out and, and about a little bit uh, and migrated to some rooms that people had told me were particularly exciting. Uh, there was a, a local vendor upstairs who had a Martin Logan system set up in a small hotel room uh, in 5.1 and was playing a lot of the classic stuff from back in the time when, when 5.1 was actively being released on SACDs and, and uh, DVD audio discs. So we listened to a little Santana and Fleetwood Mac and uh, flaming Lips and Porcupine Tree and, and, and other stuff in Surround because, as you know, I'm thoroughly a Surround person. We had a, in our room, the Madison room, we had a, uh, somewhere just on the high side of a million dollars worth of speakers and amplifiers and cables to uh, to bring the recordings in Surround that I've made out to the people that stopped by. And it was a, it was a deliberate strategy to say, well, how could you come to a trade show and not hear a, a room that had a million dollars worth of, of equipment? <laughs> And it, although there were plenty of people that, that uh, pressed notably that said, you know, maybe that's not interesting to me. We get the whole thing with, if there's video in the room, it can't be high-end audio, uh, which I would <sighs> ref refute heavily. But we had a, a great mm -hmm. time and, and uh, met a lot of people. A lot of readers of, of my blog uh, were there and introduced themselves. And, and then the uh, presentation that I gave on, on Sunday or Saturday late afternoon was was what I enjoy a lot, uh, getting it in front of people and sort of reacting to some of the stuff that, that had happened um, even the previous evening when, when John Hamm, the CEO of, of Pono, came up and, and, uh, and gave the keynote address. And, and he and I have gotten to know each other a little bit, and I'll, uh, I'll share a little bit about how that went you know, as the show goes on here. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to first ask you, though, uh, high-end audio traditionally is two-channel, and yet you you were showing multi-channel. There was an, at least one other room showing multi-channel music. How is that going? How how important is that in the high-end audio space? Uh, there's really, I don't know if it's if it's a, a you know alliteration or something like that. It's tubes, two-channel, and turntables. And the, <laughs> Is is the really the grouping for audiophiles, and and I certainly get my share of people that put their head poke their head in the door and and see you know video and see multi-channel speakers you know in this case the the German Physics Emperor MK2s which are larger than a double wide refrigerator I mean their things are just gigantic um, and say well that's not for me and 
I even play and compare and contrast a stereo mix of some of the product that I have released and then switch to the audience perspective, which puts you kind of in the best seat in the house in the recording uh, room that we, that we deal with, which is a live auditorium. And then I switch it to the 5.1 with the aggressive mix, which I call stage. And the, uh, you know, then I kind of pull the people that were there in the room and say, well, you know, hold your hand up if, if you like the 5.1. And, and a couple of people usually do. And then, you know, there were times certainly when people said they, they prefer the stereo. And it's because of what they're used to. And you know, in this particular case, you know, I said, well, it's, it's not surprising, especially in this context, that uh, people are going to stick with stereo speakers because adding three more speakers would be another $800,000. So um, <laughs> it's, you know, in that particular room, it was special. But, you know, yeah. there are no alternatives. And, and we can talk about it uh, now or a little bit later. In fact, I just had lunch with Robert Margolev, um, a very prominent engineer in the history of record making and, and uh, most notably with, with Stevie Wonder back in the 70s, um, about delivering headphone uh, presentations of 5.1 surround mixes. So while it has obviously diminished in terms of new productions that are going on in 5.1 surround mixing, there is a, a large number of, uh, of, like I mentioned before, the SACDs and DVD audios that were done back in the just past 2000 time frame, uh, as well as all the stuff from the uh, 70s and 80s in quad, those things mm. can very easily be translated, uh, transferred and, and encoded into surround files now. Mm. Getting the interest up uh, is probably, I don't want to say it's a lost cause, but it's very challenging in the audiophile space. And so when, uh, when we start looking at this, you know, it's, it's the uh, emergence of headphone delivery and quality headphones, most notably, that, that might bring us back to a place where you can listen to a, an outside of your head presentation. In, in my case, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the Smith Realizer uh, Darren Fong's got an algorithm, DTS has got an algorithm, Dolby's got an algorithm for producing, you know, a 5.1 or a more immersive presentation in your headphones simply by pre-processing or actually doing it in real time as you, as you listen to a file. But you have to start from a stereo or from a surround file, which means the only candidates are those that have already been mixed in surround. Again, a limited, a limited catalog. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got a question in the chat room already from Phoenix One uh, regarding Axbona, the show. Uh, he's uh, He, I assume, is asking about the live acoustic and then high def playback comparisons. Uh, I didn't know that uh, that, that happened at Axbona. And so first, that's the first part is, is what was that like? That's very interesting to me. And second of all, he asks, why do you think so few press and reviewers turn up for the for these kinds of demos? Are they just uncomfortable outside of their niche of compressed, band-filtered standard music? Well, I don't think, uh, certainly audiophile reviewers do not really think highly of compressed, band-filtered uh, music. You know, they're listening to high-end music, which is really what we're going to talk about today primarily. Um, but did you go to any of these kind of demos of playing something live and then, I guess, recording it and playing it right back and having a comparison like that? It was actually my idea. Oh, we well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we did it in my, in my room. I, uh, I'm a uh, big fan. Uh, one of my favorite, probably the favorite singer-songwriter is a, a gentleman from up in the Minnesota uh, area who grew up in New Jersey called John Gorka, named John Gorka. Sure. A, a really fabulous singer-songwriter and, and somebody that probably six, seven years ago, I finally cajoled into recording a project with us. So he came out and actually sat in the room that I'm in right now and did his rehearsal. And then we went downtown with uh, Susan Werner and Michael Manring. Russ Rentler is uh, a childhood uh, university uh, friend of his and uh, Amelia K. Spicer. And we did, he sang and performed 19 songs uh, with his acoustic guitar and mandolin bass and so forth. And so, you know, rather than have, we were, uh, the partners in the room were trying to figure out, well, how can we get the, how can we create something that's fun for the, for the uh, audiophile press to come by? What will, what will incite them enough or excite them enough to, to come by and experience something? So, well, we can do a party. We'll do a, you know, given the German physics uh, kind of spin, We'll do a, a Oktoberfest, except we'll call it April Fest, and then ply them with, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> ply them with beer and 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 you know uh, beer girls. Hey, well, you'll get was, the journalists. You'll get the journalists easily that way. I. It was. <laughs> that's what I figured too. But the the sad truth is, a couple of the people said we're not going to do that. 
Um, oh, man. So I came up with this idea that it turned out that, that John was going to be in town performing that Friday night, the 25th. And so I called his manager, a gentleman out of Ann Arbor, one of my old haunts, and I said, David, um, what would be the possibility of getting John out to the show? We did this from 2.30, about 3 to 3.30, actually. It was when John was there and his current touring partner, a wonderful uh, German singer-songwriter now living in, in uh, Boston, Anja Duvacott. And so I said, he'll come out. I would love him to come out and play Italian girls, to play I Saw a Stranger With Your Hair um, from the Land of the Bottom Line album. And I have the recordings of those as well. And so we'll have him sit up in front of the German physics speakers and perform acoustically, no PA system, no amplification at all. And then I will have him step aside, which he did, and play the tracks that I recorded. Now, the Italian girls were actually done solo with just he and his acoustic guitar. And it required, which I wrote a, a blog post about the other day, to play it very softly. Um, usually demo rooms are way overly cranked, and, and you can hear what's going on on the 12th floor, even down in the lobby area. It's a shame, <laughs> a shame that people equate loud with better, but, but that's a very common instance. Anyway, we turned it down and, and basically matched the, the acoustic level and the recorded level, and, and then it was kind of a live or is it Memorex uh, recording. And while I wouldn't swear that it's you know spot on, if you put a screen up, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other, it was eerily close because I do not uh, do any processing. Um, I don't you know add artificial reverb to the recordings. I don't uh, dynamically compress or equalize them. They're really a microphone or a stereo pair of microphones. Uh, in front of a singer uh, voice, and, and in this case, acoustic guitar. Um, I know Stephen Stone did come up to me at the end. He was one of the journalists that managed to make it by, and and he's a bit of a recording engineer himself, and, mm -hmm. and mentioned, well, now I understand what the proximity effect is when getting close to, a, in this case, a ribbon microphone that we use to record. Um, that, that brings out the sort of, you know, uh, Bing Crosby um, low frequency buildup, which makes everything sound so nice and rich. And so that was, that was a difference in terms of the playback uh, of the high-res recording that we did. But it was, it was as close as I have ever come. And I think those that were gathered in the room and, and, uh, and had the chance to enjoy this, because you just did it once on that Friday afternoon, um, were, were equally impressed. And I've received some emails from people, you know, really wanting to participate and others that were there saying, this was pretty pretty impressive in terms of being able to to reach for that sort of you know brass ring for audio files of well your job as an engineer is to recreate the acoustic reality a, a statement that I disagree with but I certainly uh, went in that direction with this kind of novelty act that we pulled <laughs> up. To. Well, it was to try and get the press in, and, and I can only say, and I won't name names, that a couple of press came in, took took the drink coupon, and walked out with their drink without waiting around to hear the presentation. So oh, you man. know I. Don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe I've I've written too many words in, in too many blog posts now to, to make friends with everybody because I, I, I try to tell the truth, and a lot of that run, runs counter to, to some of the stuff that's going on in the mainstream audiophile press. Mm. It was uh, a lot of this, fun. I'm, I'm sure it was, and it's, I wish I had been there. <laughs> I would have come. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the recording that you had made was not at that moment. It was in the studio and, and so right. on. Was we, that... We did it about six years ago, I think. Mm. Was that a two-channel recording or a multi-channel? Well, I record with uh, uh, many microphones uh, because of my background and, and my PhD being associated with a binaural segment. Uh, my monograph was, was on binaural audio, and I recorded with a Fritz Neumann uh, KU-81 head in a hot air balloon and on a boat and went mm. out to all these environments with my stereo Nagra at the time. And I was very familiar with that kind of recording technique, and I always record with stereo pairs of microphones, uh, except for vocals, and, and occasionally a, a, a brass instrument will be uh, just through a ribbon mic by itself. But I capture those as stereo pairs, and then uh, with lots of stereo pairs, even a large orchestra, so that I have the flexibility to remix, reposition those sounds uh, in a 5.1 surround mix or a stereo mix. And even, in fact, in my case, all of our products on our website allows you to take your pick. Download either 5.1 with you sitting in the middle of the band or download a 5.1 mix with you in the 14th row of your favorite, you know, auditorium. And we record in a big auditorium. So, you know, it is actually that sensation of capturing microphones uh, that were placed at the back of the hall and mixing them into the left and right surrounds of a 5.1 uh, mix. 
Mm -hmm. And you record at what is now called high resolution, what you have called high definition uh, specifications, the sampling rate and the bit depth in particular, that are higher, greater than what is used on CD. That's true. I, uh, uh, the console that's sitting behind me here is, is in fact a, uh, I can tilt down where you can see that puppy back there. Um, it's actually on one side, it's on the other side, because I've got a D command in there as well. But the, the reality is um, back in 2000, the time frame when DVD audio was, was just being launched and there was a great deal of excitement about this higher resolution and surround sound uh, physical delivery mechanism, SACD was part of that push too. Uh, unfortunately, we had a war between formats, which didn't really uh, help anything. Um, and nobody actually won the war. It just kind of petered out and went away, both of them. But in, fa in favor of compressed MP3, for God's sake. Yeah, it's the first time music history has seen the, you know, the lessening of quality being a march forward. It's yeah. very frustrating. But no kidding. At that point, it was uh, it was pretty obvious to me that that somebody had to go out and make new recordings at that new sample rate. In this case, my console was one of the first and 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 an only consoles that was running at 96k 24 bits digitally. Uh, there weren't any Pro Tools rigs at 192, and and soundtracks did have a console, but um, you know the R1, which is in another corner of the room I'm in, from Euphonics were were very early systems, 14, 15 years ago, that would allow me to capture. The dynamic range and the frequency response, in fact, ultrasonic frequencies that do come from musical instruments, a harmon mute, a cymbal, those kind of things have very high amounts of high, high frequency energy in them. And the dynamic range of human hearing for the first time. CDs can't do that. It's come, CDs come dangerously close. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and I think it's, it's hard to beat them until you actually consciously make a recording to try and do better. But and I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but vinyl LPs and analog tape does not even come close to delivering real-world hearing uh, in terms of dynamic range and frequency. But not that you can't like the sound that they do produce, and we've been making records that way for a long time, and most commercial records don't take advantage of that. But we now, for the first time, have the potential not only to record and mix and master, but also deliver a format that was better than a CD. And that's why AIX Records, my labels, never released any CDs. Everything was either on a DVD audio or a DVD video disc. I had them flippers. They were on opposite sides of the same disc. Um, and now on, on Blu-rays, as we started recording, because everybody's in the studio at the same time, right in this hall downtown L.A., uh, I would capture the video uh, in high def. Even 3D Blu-rays have been put out on our label because we, we did some stuff through three years ago with Panasonic cameras in 3D. I like to be on the cutting edge, but first and foremost, it was about recording high-resolution audio, letting people hear it in surround and in stereo, and showing them that dynamic range and a particular recording philosophy can, can deliver more of that live music event than, than previous formats. Um, let me show a quick graphic here uh, just to illustrate for people who are watching who might not be familiar really familiar with these terms, the one called resolution uh, basically gives a graphic representation of what's happening at a certain uh, sampling rate, frequency, at which the samples are taken, and bit depth, how many bits are being used to represent each sample. And as you can see, as we go from the left, we have a 44 kilohertz sampling rate and 16-bit resolution represented. It's not actually that. And we move over uh, towards the right, and we see 24-bit, so we have more bits being used to capture each sample, still at 44 kilohertz, sampling rate. And then finally, at the end, we have 24 bits, 96 kilohertz, which represents uh, the waveform much more closely and much more accurately. And one of the things that I learned recently um, was that there's this theorem called the Nyquist-Shannon theorem, which says, if you sample in this way, and you keep all of the frequencies you sample below half of the sampling rate, or the sampling frequency, you can reconstruct the original waveform, the original analog waveform that came into that system and was digitized. You can reconstruct it perfectly with no loss of fidelity whatsoever. Um, uh, that, that's amazing to me, and yet it's a well-proven fact. It is. Um, uh, I hate to quibble a little bit with your 
with your diagram there, but um, it's a common mistake. The fact is, you, when you move from 16 to 24 bits, you don't actually uh, show the same amplitude waveform. It gives you greater dynamic range in that 6 dB per, per bit. So the waveform would actually extend above the 16-bit box. Uh, and now we've, okay. we've, we've, we've got it so... You know what I mean? The, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Would so, so the second and third ones would be taller, right? Okay, that's gotcha. Right. That's right, because we now have an additional uh, eight bits. That eight bits times six gives us forty-eight dB of more dynamic range. It doesn't give you greater resolution at the amplitude that you are. It's a it's a very common mistake, but uh, um, and I hate to correct you here on your show. No, no, no. Show, but <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> perfectly it, fine. You know, it, this show is about. Stuff. This, this this show is about learning and understanding things, and uh, that graphic is incorrect, and I missed it, and you caught it, and I thank you very much for that. No, no, I have absolutely no need to apologize whatsoever. The ninth um, thing is absolutely true, though. The fact is that if done well, and, and there's a big... Um, big if I, there. I use the word potential because yes. under ideal circumstances with the right equipment in a room that has sufficient... Uh, noise floor being as low as possible, et cetera, et cetera. The mm -hmm. potential of a 96 kilohertz 24-bit recording um, matches or exceeds our capability of human hearing. And in fact, does PC PCM does that. And I used to, I actually had a mistake in, in what I taught in my engineering classes in that I used to think you had to have at least twice the Nyquist frequency as a sample rate in order to capture that perfectly. At least that it got better mm -hmm. if you went higher. Mm -hmm. It does it perfectly at two times the highest frequency that's in the. But it also requires that we very carefully roll off anything that would exceed that frequency like the A to D or the analog to digital conversion side, thus preventing anything that would cause us problems. And, and therein right. lies the fact that we need to have very high quality filters. We need to have higher sample rates and and in order to prevent problems that, that do and have occurred as PCM uh, started and has gotten rolling. But these days, here we are 20, 30 years out from, from some of the first really wonderful uh, moves towards PCM in the, in the CD standards, 1644.1, um, that now the engineers, digital and otherwise, have really sorted through most of those things that people quote as well. It's got this you know uh, problem with quantization error or jitter or... You know, the latest one is pre-ringing, and appetization filters have, have really knocked that one out of the picture, too. But we do an amazingly good job of, of audio capture and reproduction in PCM. I don't think it, you know, it has been approached by DSD even in the same neighborhood, and I know I get a lot of flack for that, too, not to mention there's no tools in DSD. But at the end of the day, the production methods chosen by people producing commercial records, audiophile records and jazz records and... The hits that are done in some of the other studios here in my building that are all Pro Tools all the time and they retune them and they, you know, quantize the beats and all the rest of that. The request of the productions doesn't come close to the standards of 9624. It's only for those people like Morton Lindbergh and, and Todd Garfinkel from some of the audiophile labels and myself that really push those limits beyond what is, is a traditional CD uh, a level of fidelity. Well, that was uh, one of my questions is if the Nyquist free, uh, theorem is correct and you can perfectly reconstruct everything that is half the sampling frequency or less, what's wrong with using the CD sampling rate of 44.1? Because that's more than twice what we can hear. 20 kilohertz is typically what everyone says is the upper end of the hearing range for a young person neither you nor i can hear 20 hertz 20 kilohertz i'm sure <laughs> but uh, just because of our age um so so why not why do we have to go to 20 to 96 kilohertz for example in a sampling rate why can't we just stay with 44.1 if that will reproduce everything 20 kilohertz and below with perfect fidelity it, it can if you, and, it, if, and like if I you said, follow the, those those rules yes that's right. It, it, it is a big if if we if we strive for that level of fidelity. And so, um, like I say, it's it's very hard to beat a properly done compact disc. Now, properly done in terms of all the fidelity. Uh, the last I checked, CDs don't make surround sound, so therefore they're kind of out of my my circle anyway. 
But right. the fact is, by by increasing things to 48, which is what the film industry and, and video people use, and then doubling that to 96, we actually uh, make life easier for those engineers that are designing A to D filters and D to A filters, because you don't have to have quite as steep a slope to get from 20 kilohertz and be down to you know minus 60 or minus 70 D below that within a couple of thousand uh, additional. Uh, R the range just above 20k to the yeah. to the sample to the Nyquist at 22.050. The other thing, which is which is the very much more controversial side of this, and and I'm striving very diligently to try and get funding and do some tests, a whole research project, as a matter of fact, to try and establish that having ultrasonics or those frequencies beyond 20 kilohertz on up to say 40 or 48, which is the Nyquist frequency for, for a 96K sample, um, which is what I've been using all the years, and establish that those have a perceptible difference for humans. Uh, and I get a lot of pushback from a lot of people. I don't think, you know, I can say that this is definitive. I know I spend a lot of hours in this room and have in the past mixing my projects and mastering CDs. And so anecdotally, I know that I feel a difference, but that doesn't do anything for those people who staunchly regard 20K as the, as the high range of human hearing. However, for the reasons of filters, for the reasons that there are uh, uh, interference tones, when two tones are very close to each other, or partials, they tend to beat, and, and that does affect the audio uh, um, audio band, as, as the 20 to 20 is commonly referred to. And for me, and this is where my left side of the brain kicks in, I've been in this room, and Dominic, my engineer, has been in this room when we cranked up a brought up a file that Wallace Roney recorded uh, on playing his trumpet using a Harmon mute or cymbals. This was the most dramatic example. And you look at the spectrograph and you play that through a system that's capable of reproducing frequencies higher than 20. And there are speaker systems and headphones that do that now. Um, there is sound up there coming out of that instrument. A lot of sound coming out of a, a Harmon muted trumpet and cymbals and some of the other things that we regard as having a lot of uh, harmonic and inharmonic partials way up there. So if they're in the room where you were experiencing that music acoustically, I feel like they should be reproduced through my entire production chain. And if you've got speakers and super tweeters or whatever else it takes in your headphones to, to reproduce that, then I'm giving you back the full fidelity of what happened while you were there listening to that live presentation. It doesn't in that way of thinking, it does not matter to me that somebody says, well, your ears have been checked and you can only hear to 18K or 17 or 15 or whatever it is. Um, that if it was in the room, fidelity to me means that with equipment that right now is not esoteric, it's not terribly expensive, it's not difficult to, to work with, all I have to do is push out a DVD or a Blu-ray disc and there's the 96K sampling rate and those frequencies above 20 kilohertz are in the signal being pushed out to your amplifier and speakers. Why not if it costs us nothing extra? And someday, which I think it will be, someday we will establish with some level of testing, maybe it's my test or research project or somebody else's, I believe that we will establish that yes, perhaps not through your ears, uh, some other mechanism for getting sound into our, our, our brains, um, that there will be a, a, an undoubtable or a, a provable way to say that yes, it matters with sound above 20 kilohertz. Does it matter right. above 48? Look, I'm, I'm fairly dubious when it comes to 192 having any role because I don't have any microphones that will actually capture anything higher than 48K. So right. going the next octave is a little bit of a leap for me. And 384, that, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. No, <laughs> uh, that, this, was, this was part of what I was going to bring up was you need to have equipment all through the signal chain from the microphone through the mic preamp into the mixer uh, the a to d converter and so on and then on the other end uh amplifiers and speakers for playback that can all do these ultrasonic frequencies and as you say uh, i certainly know that the speakers are available for not too much sony just introduced uh some speakers some floor standards uh, at like 500 bucks a pair that go up to 50 kilohertz right that's now, right whether and or not what, whether or not the amplifier can do that uh, is another question. It's um, easier, for, easier for the amplifier than it is for the speaker driver. For the speaker. Okay, well, there you go. Now, what about the question of 16 bits versus 24 bits? Um, 
I know that bits refer to dynamic range, and you just corrected one of my graphics, which I appreciate very much. Um, I have a graphic here to show. I'm going to jump over a couple of them that I sent to John uh, called dynamic range, which is from your website. And I want to show it here to, to illustrate that uh, dynamic range, which is the difference between the very softest you can hear, one definition, and the very loudest you can hear, or the difference between the noise floor, that is the level below which you couldn't catch anything anyway because there's noise in the room or in the electronics or whatever, and the loudest that the electronics can reproduce. Here we see some different uh, uh, dynamic ranges in, for different things. Uh, explain this chart a little bit for us, if you would. Yeah, the, the, uh, I think our baseline, uh, our par value in life is our human hearing instrument. I mean, why would we need to make, uh, you know, television sets or photographs uh, with far, far greater resolution or number of pixels per inch greater than our eyes would ever be able to, to detect? Same argument goes with audio. If, if we know that roughly under, under absolutely ideal conditions in an anechoic chamber, which I've had the uh, pleasure is what I was going to say. I'm not sure it's a pleasurable experience, but I've been there, <laughs> been in one a couple of times for an extended period, and that's the chart on the left. Human hearing can go from all the way when the when the the molecules are not bumping into each other in that room, other than the sound you get from from your own nervous system and your heart rate or your heart beating. Um, that's what I would say we should strive for, because yes, it's true most rooms will have more ambient noise than that. And our recording methodologies don't need to have any more than that. Maybe all loud all the time for certain kinds of music is appropriate. But at least we, again, come back to the potential of being able to match what you would get at a symphony hall or, you know, in an acoustic environment when people are singing or playing. So that's what's going on on the left. And then we start looking at what the, what the dynamic ranges are of certain kinds of, of uh, in the second column, it's the typical room. We go from a very quiet room can be in around the 20, 30, 40 um, dB range uh, up to, you know, the order of magnitude of, of things being loud. I mean, 85 dB is a very loud uh, sound, and, and, and theaters are, are, get complaints from the patrons when they, when they go that loud. Uh, mm -hmm. typical, mu typical music, if, if you think of the Great Gates of Kiev, or I played the Pines of Rome finale in the, in the room by Respighi that I was demoing in at Expona, and, you know, you can go from very quiet in that room, provided the audience is, is with you, um, and you can actually have quadruple forte sound levels coming out of the brass and the, and the percussion section that, that eclipse 110, 120 dB. Um, it's, a, it's a rare moment when you get much more than that, but you know, that's the kind of dynamic the range that happens in music. And then uh, the, the level uh, designations over on the, all the way on the right are the audio signals. What can we do with electronics? What can we do with... with uh, electronics in the analog domain, and Rupert Neve, a very prominent um, designer of consoles, um, developed his electronics so they would pass 100 kilohertz. And when asked why, he said he believed that it was important both for, for the integrity of the signals going through, but for phase relationships and the rest. So um, I kind of use that as, as, a, as a standard to say it's easy to get here now with the equipment that we've got, so why not? It's certainly another... Uh, tool that, that audio engineers and producers should be aware of and can make use of when they're producing records that are, you know, looking to, to maximize their fidelity. That's clearly not every record out there. It might be just a handful of records that are out there. But we now have that capability. We've had it for 15 years. Why not use it? And, and so 16 to 24 bits in terms of dynamic range is what's required to sneak past that 96 threshold, which is an optimistic threshold of a of a compact disc. It's true, as others have pointed out, that you can dither your way past 16 bits, and that's why 24 bits are, are irrelevant. But name a company that's actually producing products that actually dithers the DAC conversion from 16 bits up to something else. None of them are. So theoretically, it's possible to dither, but nobody's actually making, making products with that, uh, that capability in them. So just, just to make sure everybody understands, um, 16 bits of bit depth gives you a theoretical maximum of 96 decibels or dB of dynamic range. And you can use this technique called dithering, which adds some noise to the signal in a certain way, in a very controlled way to actually increase that dynamic range. But as you say, if no one's doing it, it's, it makes no difference. That's right. And, and 16 bits 
if you actually do the the spectrographs and you look at with some of these very easy to use tools, uh, Adobe Audition is one that I use quite frequently and and post spectrographs um, on my on my blog site. Um, from it constantly and it has a dynamic analysis tool and shows you the frequency span of such things that are that are downloaded and may not or or may you know actually have high frequency content in them or not and if you do the dynamic range not with the fade out that goes to dead zero but in the middle of the tune when there's something to actually measure typical dynamic ranges right now are 10 is really good 2 to 3 db is typical that means it's Basically, all out all the time. Two and to so, three dB dynamic range is typical. Yes, very much. Wow, so. wow. As a mastering engineer, the reality is, um, and and I know this has happened to actually one of the clients here in this in the studio recently with the project that they mastered, that we have been on a a decades long uh, search for the loudest record, and with digital yeah. tools like with names like Ultra Maximizer. I mean, there's a scary term. We make yeah, everything really. loud all the time. So there is none <laughs> of the things that you practiced all those years ago to have the quietest possible pianissimo coming out of your trombone. Forget yep. about it. When you hand that off to a mastering engineer, their judgment under the direction of the label and most notably the manager who's trying to get your record to compete with, you know, Imagine Dragons, Scott, it's not loud enough. I need to make your pianissimo forte. So they do. And they correct all those irregularities in dynamic range that you practice so hard and master the life out of the record. Two and three times. When I did Bad Company's mastering in this very room, uh, Paul Rogers sitting right be, you know, behind me, we had to send it back. Or they sent, the label sent it back five times and said it's not loud enough. So all of this nonsense about this is what the artist's intent is and, and that records sound like we want them to sound is not true. They sound like all of the other records. And we have this glacial drift. It's not so glacial, actually. It's, it's happening quite rapidly where everything loud is considered good and everything with dynamic range is considered, you know, less commercial, won't sell as many records. And after all, what are we interested in? Selling more records or making records that sound great? If you're a new artist, it's making money. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, there, there, I mean, there are some reasons to reduce the dynamic range. I don't think as much, I, I, I hate to think of it as being only 2 dB, but, uh, you know, if you're listening in your car on the radio or, or some player or walking down the street with, with your earbuds in listening to something, um, you're, if it's got a very wide dynamic range, you're not going to hear those soft parts. That's absolutely true. So here's, here's, and I've, I've, given some presentations over the last year. I went to all the trade shows this year and, and I usually get roped into doing a presentation or two. If we have abandoned, and it's a big if, although it's moving in that direction, if we've abandoned physical spinning discs as our delivery platform, although there's big attempts to get Blu-ray to be now the new delivery platform with the pure audio format. Right, um, I was going to ask if, you about that. Hold that, hold that aside okay. for a second. If we, if we actually say discs have gone away, then a site like my iTrack site, or and certainly the new version of the site that I'm pulling together, 2.0 iTrack, um, can offer you personalized music delivery. And I do this even on the Blu-ray disc that we sell right now. If you actually take a Blu-ray disc from, from my catalog, you can get various mixes on the same disc. The stereo, the 5.1, the 5.1, and you can get an MP3 that is mastered and at 320 kbps for listening in your iPod, uh, in your smartphone. There is as well a set of headphones XI tracks on that disc or downloadable from my site that allows you to listen to surround through headphones. Now imagine how that goes if you spin that idea out a little bit and you get to the point where you have a pull down menu on the future eye tracks that allows you to select the tune like Burger King, have it your way. You can, have it heavily, <laughs> you can have it heavily mastered because you know you're going to be traveling in your car or listening through iBuds, earbuds, or maybe you'd like it that way. iBuds, I like that idea. Hey, um, there you go. <laughs> Sell that to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the reality is uh, until you hear it, you don't know what you're missing. And we sadly have not been getting anything in that regard other than from the audiophile labels. So the mainstream people don't know. I had Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails in this room. Uh, it's been a year and a half, something like that. And I snagged him on his way, you know, in and out. And I chatted with him for probably 30 minutes. I was very impressed that he was interested and would tolerate my spewing. But 
he's a guy that's very interested in quality. And I got talking to him about, well, you know, wouldn't it be possible to have a, a couple of different mastered versions? So sure enough, on hesitation marks that came out probably three, four months ago, something like that, maybe last fall, um, he has an audiophile mastered version for $9. You buy it off of his website and he gives you the audiophile version mastered for free. And then there was the CT, a CD and iTunes version of the track. Well, guess which one was louder? The audio file. Really? Well, really. Uh, I, there's a post on my site that, that did the spectrograph on it. Now, it's true that there is slightly more dynamic range. I think it got to 3 or 4 dB on the <laughs> audio, audio file version. The uh, audio ver file version was 3 or 4 dB dynamic range. <laughs> Uh, it was one for the for the heavily compressed CD version. Oh my God! And it was. I mean, there's tricks in mastering where you you basically crank everything up just above the maximum of 16 bits, so it's distorting, in fact. And then you yes. you can then you pull it. It looks like a brick because everything is all loud all the time. And then you pull it back 0.2 of a dB, so it doesn't throw the mastering or replication facility on their laser beam recorders. Won't kick it out with an error. And that's how most records are actually mastered these days, is over the top and then pulled back just a little bit so that when it goes into random or shuffle mode on your CD player or your iPod, all of them sound all out all the time. It's a tragedy. So it is. With, with personalized delivery, everybody can have it like they want it. Why not? If you like music that way, and I don't find a lot of people that really do, but if you do, no problem. They're all there. But why not, have, why not have several different versions available for downloading depending on your own personal taste? Because they're coming down as files. We can certainly do that. I am on yeah. iTrack. Yeah. Well, what, what is the deal with this Blu-ray Pure Audio project? Because um, at NAB last month, I heard Sony talk about it. And I know that there are some European concerns that are talking about it. Uh, I, I figure you must be involved because it's part of this high-resolution audio thing that seems to be gaining momentum these days. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we only have about 18 minutes left here. so <laughs> I, I know. Well, and, and let me just put the pitch, because I know there's a bunch of my readers watching this thing as well, that if, if uh, you can get an awful lot of what's between my ears on, on realhd-audio.com, which is my daily blog, so I haven't missed a day in over a year. And there are something like 3,000 people a day listening to what I have to say. And I get a question every once in a while, hey, don't you run out of things to write about? So not yet. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> there's always something going on. One of those things that's going on is this, uh, what Universal Music Group and a French replicator came up with um, called High Fidelity Pure Audio Blu-ray. As well, uh, a company in Germany, MSM Studios, by, uh, run by a gentleman named Stefan Bach, um, who has done a number of projects with Morton, I mentioned earlier at 2L and, and other labels, which his was just called Pure Audio uh, Blu-ray Discs. Well, they finally made friends and gotten together, and now it's just Blu-ray Pure Audio. This is the next generation, no video, no visual, uh, physical disc delivery platform. And I have written several articles which were very critical of why in the world would anybody spend $30 to get the same tracks that we had back in the 60s, Bob Marley, the Rolling Stones, you know, classics by, you know, out of the catalog of Universal and others. Why would anybody pay $30 to have that put three times, the same stereo mix on a spinning Blu-ray disc for 30 bucks, which has no more fidelity than what we had back in 1965? Makes no sense to me at all. The, they take the video off essentially there's because there isn't any video those things so i'm and i'm approached i actually had a conversation with uh rob Aubrey, bobby from sony the other day because their tool for blu-rays actually includes this capability now and i said rob you know uh, why would this be interesting to me what you're telling me is to, in order to get the pure audio blu-ray logo i have to strip the video off of my products which are high def and some in 3d as i mentioned how much sense does that make and he said, well, I get it. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm the perfect candidate because my stuff is actually natively recorded in high resolution and would benefit from the Blu-ray high resolution, uh, you know, Dolby uh, True HD or the DTS HD uh, MA master audio format. I'm, I'm a prime candidate. And as I got thinking about it, I have, I've changed my mind. I know my readers will be immediately 
uh, doubtful of my integrity. He changed his mind. What did he change his mind about? Because <laughs> I'm pretty staunch in my in my beliefs. Well, I said, you know, as I contemplate taking the DVD audio discs that I made ten years ago, Grant Geisman and uh, Lawrence Juber, some of these products that I'm beginning to run out of stock. Do I want to go out and make more DVD audio discs? Because it's expensive to replicate discs. Or perhaps those would be better recast as Blu-ray Pure Audio with not the same mix in three different uh, formats, but three different mixes, a stereo mix and a 5-1 audience and a 5-1 stage and maybe a headphone mix all on the same disc that you simply, uh, for those of you, and, and there are lots of people still out there that have trouble with, with downloads and files and FTPs and all the rest of that, they just simply purchase a disc, slide it in the drawer, and hit play. And they don't have to have a video monitor attached to it. Blu-ray Pure Audio gives you the option or gives you the ability to simply hit a number on the, the numeric keypad, and it goes to that track. If you do have a video monitor hooked up, it gives you a graphic with the name of the tune and maybe some pretty art behind it. So it does make some sense in that regard, but it's expensive to make Blu-ray discs. I mean, I have the capability to create the masters here, but with all the royalties and the Blu-ray Association licenses and the, uh, you know, exorbitant mastering fees, it's a major commitment for a small label like mine to say, okay, I've got another 20 products I want to put out on pure audio uh, format. I'm thinking about it very seriously, but in general, if you watch their, their promotional video, virtually everything they say in there is nonsense with nice <laughs> graphics nice graphics and beautiful 3D animations. But mm -hmm. uh, it comes back to the term that I coined or applied for the, for the first time to audio provenance. If the original tracks weren't made with high-resolution audio recording gear, then a uh, retransfer of that original analog tape into a 192 kilohertz bucket isn't going to magically you know, fill the fidelity potential of a recording that was made now at 192. That's... People that know what I, uh, you know, stand for, that's the essential key. And I'm advocating very strongly in the various committees that I'm on at the CEA and the AES and the NARIS committee that we be completely transparent about what it is that people downloading high-resolution files or so-called high-resolution files are getting because I get a lot of pushback. You know, I downloaded this and it doesn't sound any different than the vinyl I had in 1973. And the reality is it isn't any different. So they, they, they get shy and say, I'm not going to spend any more money on, on high-resolution downloads. If we actually told them what they're getting, and maybe they were remastered with some additional you know, tools, techniques, and ears, and left alone in terms of dynamic range, maybe they would be worth purchasing. But for the most part, a CD version ripped you know, uh, is, is just as good as a high-resolution download. Well, you're, you're bringing up this this term provenance and you're the first person I heard I have heard use it in regard to what what happened in the signal chain all the way from the recording the original recording through the entire process and if it was from long ago 20 30 years ago uh, done on analog tape and maybe the noise reduction wasn't very good back then and so on you're not going to get the dynamic range so you don't need more than 16 bits you're probably not going to get the frequency response above 20 kilohertz, so why use high sample rates? Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, but one that's very difficult to verify. How do you verify the provenance of a, a given recording? Well, you can certainly start from the fact that anything that you pull up as a potential purchase on a download site that was made before 1980, 1982, was an analog master. Right. And I just had lunch, as I said, with, with Stevie Wonder's uh, engineer, Robert Margolev, and I asked him, I said, so um, Inner Visions, how'd you record that? That was a two-inch 24 track, the very thin tracks. Yes. That was, that was the standard for, I'd say, the high 90%. I mean, we had a Stevens machine with, with 32 tracks, I think, uh, back to the studio I first started engineering at. But the on a two-inch tape. On two, still on two-inch tape. Although there was a joke at AES once where they had an eight-inch reel of tape, uh, I think it weighed, <laughs> uh, weighed 100 pounds, and there was no transport to our heads ever built. But um, <laughs> we can do that with Pro Tools, you know, on a laptop now. 
But Robert right. told me, okay, great. We take uh, Stevie uh, or Fleetwood Mac, you know, Rumors record, Ken Calais a friend, and, and I know that that album's got a whole story behind it too because they had, they had to transfer all the overdubs onto the original Safety Master because all the high frequencies have gone away after 1,700 hours of passing it across the heads. Mm. But the native, if you did the very best possible job on analog tape on a two-inch machine with no noise reduction, that's equal to about 10 bits of dynamic range. The, the specifications on those machines, and I have one. There's one uh, uh, two-track machine sitting over in the corner of my Nagra. It's about 60 to 72 dB of dynamic range. Do the math, that's 12 bits, max. Mm -hmm. Then you transfer that over during the mix down to another two-track analog tape. Every transfer you lose 6 dB, that's another bit going away. That's not done yet either. Then you got to make a safety copy. Then you got to send it to the mastering engineer. So by the time the lacquer cutter, the disc cutter, gets it to make your vinyl, you're two or three generations down, maybe even more. And each one of those costs you a bit. Do the math. Yeah. Most yeah. of the recordings are in the 8 to 10 bit dynamic range or you know, 40 to 50, uh, 55 maybe. And it may not be important because, again, loudness and mastering makes tracks punchy and makes them audible on the radio and so forth. But we were doing a hell of a lot better back when I had my AR100 turntable and was listening to vinyl in my dorm room or my wool and sack, you know, reel-to-reel -reel machine <laughs> than you are with, with earbuds and an iPod and, and even a mastered for iTunes download from, from Apple. It's just, the, the, the fact is the information isn't out there. I got an email from a guy the other day listening to, uh, I don't know if it was an audio program or it was read in the Wall Street Journal. The guy just was up and down, you know, playing simple folks, the best possible audio fidelity you can get is on a piece of vinyl. Digital might be able to get there someday, but it's not there yet. And that is so <laughs> far from the truth. It's, he must be sponsored by somebody who wants to sell him a $20,000 turntable. I just I have a hard time with that. That's a, well, that's a, it's a niche market, and it certainly makes sense for some people. But a uh, you know, $400 or $500 Oppo player or a benchmark DAC connected to your Mac Mini will do a far better job with the right software than any piece of vinyl on the planet. Well, in fact, Big Ginge in the chat room is asking, what are your views on the fact that the popularity of vinyl is, in fact, increasing? It is. It's gone from, you know, uh, 100,000 units a year to a quarter of a million. That's still 2% of the whole music business. Yeah. So Spend it's still it not very you, much. Not very much. Yeah. Spend it if you like it. If you want it, that's fine. But, you know, I've sat in a room with a, with a turntable that was $260,000. Uh, and it took us three hours to set the thing up. I just, you know, <laughs> I'd rather buy a Mercedes or, you know, actually a smart car and take the rest to, to you know, in vacation with a year-long trip around the world. It just <laughs> makes no sense to me. Right. Well, I uh, I wanted to just point out to everybody that uh, just yesterday I I oh posted a, a piece on AVS Forum uh, which you helped with and, and you are quoted in, uh, asking if high resolution audio is irrelevant. And the, really the, the first impetus for it was the introduction by Neil Young of the Pono player. And, uh, you know, that has take, gotten national attention. He was on Letterman's show talking about it. And we have a picture of the Pono player to show everybody in case you happen to be watching. Uh, this weird triangular shaped thing, which to me says, well, it's not very pocket friendly, uh, but that may be beside the point. But he's advocating uh, like 2496 or better, 24192 audio. Um, and I believe he has made some comments about making sure that the artist is involved in the whole process and making sure that the provenance is good, that the original recording uh, is digital at 2496 or 192 uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is your sense of this Pono player and, and the whole uh, thrust that Neil Young is promoting? Um, well, I, I can say that last Saturday I had my hands on a Pono player for the first time. Uh, standing right next to John Hamm, the CEO of, of Pono. Uh, as I mentioned before, I watched his keynote address, and, and, and I have uh, at least become acquainted with him. He'll pick up the phone when I call him, and I'm hoping to get up to, to, to visit with he and Neil, you know, as soon as Neil gets off from his tour here, his solo tour. Um, and I think they, they have, 
have built a beautiful piece of equipment. Uh, maybe the form factor could be more friendly, but it kind of, you know, if it sits on your desk and becomes a replacement for, for a small music server and you can travel with it, so much the better. Um, but it comes back to me to uh, the provenance issue that, in fact, the, the major labels have, have dedicated areas, both their mastering people and, and licensing legal organization or parts of their team, that are in the business of maximizing the returns on their investment of, of retransferring an analog master, not just for archive purposes these days, but now for actually distribution through sites like David and, and Norman Chesky and their HD tracks down the site. And there's several others, and, and I'm actually very interested in, in distributing high-quality versions of, of analog masters transferred the right way. But I decided that I simply couldn't rationalize investing what is a very large sum of money as an upfront licensing cost to secure the rights to the same things that are already available through HD tracks and uh, Studio Pro Masters and Super High Res and all these sites that have come along now and joined into the, the fray. iTrax was started in the fall of 19 or 2007, rather, it was the world's first high resolution download site and still is the only one that in my own definition of high res that produce, that allows you to download only high resolution content. Anything came from an analog tape, it's not on iTrax because it's not a high resolution file. It's a recasting of a standard definition file into a large bit bucket, which we label for marketing and sales purposes as high resolution. So I, I kind of explained that to, to, to John, who I think gets it. He's an audio file and understands that that Pono is not going to be in the remastering business. They're going to take the materials as presented by those areas of the, the three major labels, the Universals and the Warner Brothers and the Sonys, and they're going to offer them for sale in the fall and October on their, on their site. I'm advocating in, in very strong terms that we need to make sure that not only are the standard catalog items available from those big three part of the catalog offered through Pono Music, but wouldn't it be cool to put some stuff like I engineer records that doesn't use any of the sort of normal commercial radio friendly processes. In fact, I don't master my records for dynamics. I make sure that they, they're the right loudness in terms of relationships to each other and so forth. So it's, it's interesting to me because I, I grabbed or I cajoled uh, John to come into the demo room that we had Saturday morning and sit down in, in a million dollars worth of speakers I kicked the guy out of the sweet spot in the middle of the room, and I said, yeah, I'd like to play you a few things. And I did. I played Dave Mason playing an acoustic 12-string guitar with a percussionist and, a, and a, another solo guitar player. I played John Gorka, a singer-songwriter that I talked about earlier with just a solo guitar and, and his voice. And I played another track that, that shall remain anonymous um, that's one of the best I've ever recorded. That's very intimate and emotional and, and all the things that we want music to do to us. And I dropped his jaw. He just was thoroughly impressed. I think honestly so. It wasn't just saying, yeah, it sounds really good. I mean, he was, he was uh, I'm not sure, aware of just how powerful a recording can be if your goal from the very first moment you turn on the record button is to capture someone making, making music. And so I did that. Um, and... The results, I think, were, I've got to have that John Gorka disc. I'd like to go back and, and, and show it to Neil. And so the hope is that, that we can get together and augment what they offer beyond that, which HD Tracks and others has, with some tracks, uh, engineered, produced, whatever you want to call it, that follow my general uh, rules of thumb to, to, to produce, I think, something that will, that will be very impressive when... When I watch the, the Pono promotional video and there's all these big time rock stars staying and, and uh, Bruce Springsteen and, you know, the rest of them get out of the 1970 something Cadillac and say, oh, my gosh, this is the best thing I've ever heard. I'm a little dubious at that. One, because they're listening through a car system. And two, <laughs> you know, I don't think and I said it in a post that I don't think any of these rock stars have ever heard high resolution music some guy up in Montana wrote me back and said, that's the most arrogant and ignorant statement I've ever heard you say. And, and, I, and I stand by it because I don't think they're ever given a chance to listen to recordings the way that I've made them. 
They are very good and far better than I am at making money with the music that they produce. But at the end of the day, there's got to be somebody out here that, that's attempting to, to change the direction or augment the direction uh, of Pono and, and others with recordings that actually do what I know after making 85 of them um, can be accomplished with the, with the right kind of engineering and production techniques. I think John was very impressed. I know the people that came into our room were very impressed. Um, you know, my mission right now is not to make a million dollars, it's to actually change the music business and the engineering side, and that's going to come from engineers, producers, the nearest people from the Grammy organization, to say, and John's on board with this, what are the best practices in terms of preparing new recordings that will offer up the kind of fidelity that a Pono player and some of the others that are out there on smartphones can offer? I mean, that's, that's the reality that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier uh, a moment ago about the emotional impact of music. And I, I wonder about whether or not uh, the higher resolution music that has been recorded to begin with in that way and passed through the signal chain in that way and played back in that way might have a greater emotional impact. It relates to a question that a couple people in the chat room are bringing up, which is about vinyl and tube electronics having a, a soul and an intimacy uh, that uh, the digital does not. Those are two related but somewhat different subjects. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, I would disagree that they have more soul and, and, and more emotional warmth and all the other things attributed to to, uh, uh, to vinyl and to analog tape to a degree from which vinyl is generally made. Um, the, the reality is that is a sound that is the result of whatever distortions, harmonic or otherwise, that are produced by the tubes, that are uh, produced by the, the stylus moving and the cartridge and all the rest of it. I get that. And that's why it's so important for me to sit there and play a tune uh, in a demo circumstance that has all of that emotion and all of that warmth and all of that uh, depth of color and is more importantly an exact or very accurate representation of the signal that came in through the microphones delivered back through your speakers. That's fidelity to me. If you choose to modify the sounds in a certain way that gives you, you know, a more euphonious sound to your ears, so be it. Do it. That comes back to the discussion of personalized music delivery. But at right. the end of the day, I'm looking for accurate. I would like to know that when that woman sings through that microphone that I'm going to get all of that back out without it being twisted or distorted or turned around in such a way that it says, oh, I like that. You know, you can always take something that's accurate and, and pure and, and has a great deal of fidelity and turn it into something else. There are tape emulators and vinyl emulators and even a company in Europe now that, that cuts a groove in a, in a copper master during a, a, a session and then has a pickup on the other side and instantaneously digitizes it and they release that as their downloads in DST. Now it sounds like vinyl. Okay. And I, and I certainly respect that other people have different opinions and ideas about it. But at the end of the day, for me, I know that after having played to hundreds and thousands of people and, and the customers that I've got, an Absolute Sound magazine comes back and having sat in this room and listened to some of the stuff that I've played for them, They've never heard anything like it, that it's just a completely new experience. And, and if anybody's interested out there, at the real uh, hd-audio.com, there is a button on there that says download some free files. I've got 12 files, some headphone files, a bunch of other stuff that you can download and listen for yourself. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't work, you know, then, then final is maybe your solution. Um, one last thing before you go. Uh, uh, Muller House in the chat room is saying, I think the problem is that us regular folks don't have access to the equipment to enjoy the quality of music that you're talking about. I myself would disagree. I gave an example of the uh, Sony speakers, $500 a pair. Uh, the Pono player is not cheap for a portable player, but it's it's 400 bucks uh, and has the potential anyway for uh, reproducing these higher fidelity uh, recordings. Uh, what's your thought on that? You don't need to spend a lot of money to get this kind of sound. Um, in fact, I think people spend way too much money for essentially, and, and use your scale. I mean, in the, in the audiophile world, saying that you're going to put a complete system together for $5,000 uh, is, is about equivalent to a power cord six feet long. 
um, which, <laughs> which is a whole nother topic that I don't want to. Right. Uh, no, no, no. We don't have time to get into that right now. <laughs> which, uh, another, we'll come back in another year. But yes. here's what you do. You get a, a, a you get an Oppo player for maybe 500, 500 bucks. 500 bucks. And then you get a, uh, a good set of headphones. I happen to be a big fan. And they had their HA1 headphone amplifier back in Chicago, which is the first time it's been publicly seen. And a set of, of Oppo, you know, PM1 headphones. That's less than $4,000, $2,500. If you like surround, then you get a Smith Re or Research Real Room Realizer. For 5000 bucks, you can hear exactly what I'm hearing in this room in the privacy of your own headphone space at home in your apartment and it will sound every bit as glorious as listening to you know a quarter of a million dollar playback studio yeah it doesn't yeah. have to cost a lot of money well with that i know you have to run so i'm going to uh say thank you so much for being here uh mark waldrop is the founder and chief engineer at aix records and you can find him at aixrecords.com uh, you can download a lot of his files at itracks.com and you can read his daily blog hasn't missed a day in a year at realhd-audio.com. Thanks so much, Mark, for being here. Oh, you're, you're very welcome, Scott. Good to see you again. You too. Um, you can find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott, also at avsforum. And you can find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg and also on our YouTube channel at youtube.com uh, slash twit home theater geeks. I know I'll get that right sooner or later. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be David Reisner, an Academy Award winning technical consultant to the cinema industry. And we're going to be talking about all the latest news in the digital cinema world. Something I'm very familiar with uh, and interested in learning more about. And I hope you will join me for that. Until then... Geek out.